Thanks to Dell for sponsoring this video with a precision line of workstation laptops. We're working with some super complex volumetric materials, notoriously difficult for computers to render. But to prove just how fast this portable workstation is, we're going to be rendering the entire galaxy on just the laptop. So stay tuned for that later on in the video. So we've created rocks, we've created trees, we've created mountains, we've created cities, we've created... Whatever this is. We've even created the world! But now it's time to go beyond that. Further than that. What is beyond our sight? What is beyond our knowledge? What is out there that has not yet been explored? The mysteries of space. The unknown beyond. The... What... <laughs> Yeah, we're creating, we're creating space. Hey guys, it's Steve here from CG Geek. We're creating the unknown beyond the space, nebulas, galaxy type, universal, cool looking things in Blender. And it's actually so much easier than you might think. Now, while trying to understand some of the mysteries of the universe, I reached out to some of the Blender wizards out there. And for this, some might say, why not reach out to the best Blender out there? The big D, Captain Disillusion himself, since, you know, he's living in space anyways. But figured he was likely too busy saving the world from internet idiots. And Alan was just no help at all. Gleb Alexandrov in particular was super helpful with this project by sharing some of the secrets he learned along the way while he was creating some nebulas a few years back in Blender. And Tim Barton, who's created some stunning looking space scenes in Blender on YouTube. But now, armed with some knowledge from some of the Blender greats, I jumped into Blender, ready to start tackling space. So I started off with the default cube, scaled it up real big, and just threw the basic print basical <laughs> and I added a principled volume shader to it then for the environment lighting I just went completely black or just very very dark blue I only work in black and sometimes very very dark blue because that's basically space but I did leave the default lamp in the scene because I'm going to be using this at a really bright intensity to light up our volumetrics seeing this a super crazy high value of like 500,555 or whatever you want, but big. Doesn't have to be nothing but fives, but just a big number. <laughs> then to displace the volumetrics in a really cool formation, we need some textures. Now lucky for us normal people that aren't wizards at using nodes, there's some artists out there like Simon Thomas that have released some more advanced noise textures for Blender that are free to download. I'll link to them in the description if you guys want to make your own nebula at home. Essentially, this is just a basic noise texture, but with some special math nodes added to it, along with another noise texture, giving it some more complexity and detail over just a normal Blender noise texture. So I downloaded these and just using one of his basic noise textures plugged straight into the density, nothing else, you could already see, just using a color ramp to condense these values, it was already looking like some cool cloud formations. And if you were just making clouds, this would be like all you really have to do. And then the real secret comes in when you just duplicate this noise group and connect it to the vector. This just gives some crazy cool volumetric displacements in the basic default cube here. Now you can spend a lot of time tweaking the settings on these noise textures, and this is how you can create all sorts of different looking sort of negative and space scenes. The settings I used are on the screen here, just some smaller values along the scale with some distortion and noise to really give that wavy sort of space like. <laughs> So now, remember that super bright lamp that we added? If you grab that light, give it some nice blue light -like colors and start moving it around inside that cube, you can see that it can give some really cool in-camera effects as it's sort of backlighting some of that volumetric displacement inside of the cube. And the more you just kind of move the lamp around now in the cube until you find it highlighting some really cool shapes within that volumetric displacement, then I just went ahead and duplicated this lamp two, three times, giving the different point lights some different colors to give us that kaleidoscope of cool space-like imagery. Playing around with this a lot until you start seeing it highlight formations in that cube that just looks really dope until I found something that I was really happy with. But then this is where the game changes. Jumping to the Blender render settings, I need to do some things to make it so it renders these volumetrics more awesome basically. I started by taking all the light bounces down to basically just one as you don't really need any light path bounces in the scene for this. But then under the volume settings you can take the max steps down to something like 256. The real important part though is the step rate. This is something that I never expected to make as much difference as it actually does. But taking this from a value of one down to just 0.1 totally changes the way these volumetrics are rendering and starts giving you a ton of detail within this volumetric displaced cube. Granted this is going to hurt your render times a lot so having something fast like the RTX 5000 GPU inside of our Dell Precision laptop for example shout out to the sponsor of this video you'll be able to render these scenes too if you're rendering just on a CPU or a slower computer this is gonna really hurt your rendering times but make things look so much better but with that setup you can see that it kind of changes the lighting of the scene so then I just played around with the color ramp adjusting the sliders to bring back some of the color intensity that I wanted 
from those value metrics. Now that's rendering in much more detail. Then I just increased the overall intensity of the density by adding in a math node, changing it to multiply, and using this as the controller then to change just how dense I want my value metrics being. The next step that gave some really cool results to my volumetric rendering was giving it some anastrophe. By adjusting the value from black to a brighter, sort of slightly reddish color, this added sort of another layer of color into your volumetrics by adding some anastrophe to it, just making it look a little bit more impressive. And then another option is just adding color to the volumetrics itself, because right now the only thing lighting it is just the lamps in the scene. For this, I just used another color ramp with some lighter gray tones and just a slice of some lighter orange in there, connecting this to the principled volume color. And this sort of light, lights up your space nebula. And just another layer of color to the value metrics, making it a little bit more appealing to the eye, I thought. Then you can just go ahead and start rotating that cube around and moving the camera around as well, finding different angles in your nebula for something that might look visually appealing to your eye, because there's gonna be so many different cool patterns in here. I just played around with it for a long time until I found something that was just pretty cool looking to the camera angle. And that's all that really matters. Also, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, we did create the world, and we've actually created the moon as well on the channel. So you can actually take these planets now and kind of drop them into your space nebula, where if you find these sort of cool holes or shapes in the volumetrics, the next step in our epic journey was to add some stars to our space, because that looks really cool. It gives you a sense of movement and space and just general awesomeness. So for this, super easy. You just want some really low poly geometry. So I added an icosphere and took it down to a level one. Then the material was as basic as it gets. I just added an object info node so I could take the random factor into the color of the emission color on the principal shader and use a hue saturation node dropped in there. Gave it just a tiny bit of color and used the object info to randomize the hue then. So it could be any color in that sort of spectrum. Then just giving the emission strength a value of like 10 to 20 so those stars light up nice and bright. Then I was able to just grab my whole cube that all the volumetrics are inside of and add a new particle system to our volumetric shape here. For particle settings, it was super simple, just like 5,000 stars start and end at frame one, so they're not being added to the scene as the animation would play out. Give them a long lifetime of like 500 frames, and then distributed these particles by the volume, so they're all contained inside the cube instead of on the outside of the cube. Took out any of the initial velocity on those particles and gave it zero gravity, so they're just gonna float in space without moving. Then I just gave them a small scale with some random size, and that was literally all I had to do to add stars to my space. But now it's into the render settings, and this is where things get really interesting, because with the default settings, rendering this scene would take a long time, even with the best hardware. But there's one thing I've learned over the years using NVIDIA RTX GPUs and optics in the newer versions of Blender. Denoising works really well, but it actually works even better on larger images because think about it, because there's more details being rendered at a larger scale for it to be able to be intelligent and use its AI to denoise these different areas of the scene. And if you have a lot of VRAM, like the Dell Precision laptop I have here with 16 gigabytes of VRAM, you might as well crank the resolution up really high because there's plenty of memory there to handle all of the data in the scene. And if you have a large resolution, I'm going all the way up to almost 4K for this, you can get away with a lot less samples. So taking the samples from the default value of like 5,000 all the way down to 256 will actually be enough in this case to get a lot of detail still in our nebula render. So make sure you're denoising your scene and using optics because that's gonna be the fastest if you have an RTX GPU in your computer or laptop. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, I'm doing a render now of our finished space nebula on the Dell Precision portable workstation laptop. Rendering on the GPU, this one has Nvidia's RTX A5000 mobile chip in it. Actually, I was pleasantly surprised how quiet it was throughout the entire render. Final render finished in just over 12 minutes and this exact scene took well over an hour to render on a Threadripper 32 core 64 thread CPU. And that's what makes these mobile workstations from Dell so impressive. If you have to work away from home or on the road, well, good luck hauling your desktop PC. The Dell Precision laptops can be customized depending on your workflows and budget. Learn more by clicking the link down in the description. But enough talking, it's time to sit back and fly through the universe that we just created.
was a ton of fun again. A huge thanks to some of the Blender wizards like Gleb Alexandrov that helped share some of their knowledge with me. And again, a big thanks to Dell and their Precision line of laptops for sponsoring this video. Check them out with the link in the description below. That's it for me, guys. Stay awesome. Keep creating and be kind to one another. I'll see you all in a future video. Peace out.